so I am here to tell you guys about the craziest thing that ever happened to me. But before I do that, I want to show you something. This is a list of 100 random words. Apple, ear, banana, mango, flatulence, thought, pear, silence, plum, decapitate, so on. So if I said to you, you have 15 minutes to commit that list of 100 random words to memory, and you have to do it in perfect order, and you can't make any mistakes. How many of you think you could do that? <laughs> One person. Uh, she already read my book. Uh, so I, I also scoffed the first time somebody suggested to me that that was within the realm of human possibility. But it turns out it totally is. And 30 minutes from now, everybody in this room is going to understand, at least in theory, how to do it. So let me back up for a step. My background is I'm a science journalist. And a number of years ago, Slate Magazine sent me to go cover this wacky sounding contest called the United States Memory Championship. And I figured this was going to be like the Super Bowl of savants. This was going to be a bunch of freaks of nature from like the long tail of humanity's bell curve. And I showed up, and it was a bunch of men and women performing the most miraculous feats of memory you could possibly imagine. They were memorizing hundreds of random numbers after looking at them just once. They were memorizing the names of dozens and dozens of strangers who they'd never met before. Uh, there was one event where they were memorizing an entire poem in just a few minutes, and an event where they were memorizing the order of a shuffled pack of playing cards in just a few minutes. And I said, OK, these are people who have absolutely nothing in common from me, and there's nothing that I could possibly learn from them. And then I met this guy. This is Ed Cook, who at the time had the, one of the best memories in all of Europe. And he had come to this US memory championship basically as like spring training for the world memory championships, which were going to be in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia that year. And I was standing outside the competition hall to like, escape the, the sweaty locker room that it was. And he was smoking a cigarette, and we started talking. And he says to me, you know, uh, all of these people in here have just average memories. They've all trained themselves to perform these miraculous feats of memory using a set of ancient techniques, techniques that were invented 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece, techniques that were once widely known and widely practiced. These were the same techniques that Cicero had used uh, to memorize his speeches on the floor of the Roman Senate, the same techniques that Roman generals had used to memorize the names of hundreds, thousands of soldiers under their command, the same techniques that medieval scholars had used to memorize entire books. And these techniques have basically been forgotten about, he told me. But anybody can learn them, even you. And I said, oh, <laughs> that's interesting. And my sort of journalist alarm bell was going off. And I ended up spending the better part of the next year living under this guy's wing, learning all of these ancient techniques and trying to see if I could, in fact, train my memory. But also, I spent that year trying to investigate my memory trying to understand how it works and why it sometimes doesn't work and what its potential might be. Now, a few years ago, a group of scientists at the University College of London brought a handful of these memory champions, people like Ed Cook, into their lab. And they wanted to know, how do these guys do it? It was the same question that I had. And they gave them a bunch of tests. First, they said, like, maybe these people are just smarter than the rest of us. They gave them a bunch of cognitive tests, and the answer was they're not. Then they thought, maybe their brains are somehow structurally, anatomically different from the rest of ours. They weren't. They did find one really interesting and really telling difference between these memory champions and everybody else. And that is when they put these people into an fMRI chamber and looked at what parts of their brains were lighting up when they were learning new information, when they were being asked to remember numbers or people's faces or pictures of snowflakes, they found that the memory champions were activating different regions of the brain than their control subjects. And importantly, specifically, they were activating regions of the brain associated with visual and spatial memory. These were the same regions of the brain that you would expect to light up if you were walking a trail in Aspen or driving your car around the neighborhood. So why would they be using these parts of their brain? We're going to get back to that in just one second. First, though, oops, go back a step. 
when I uh, got up on the stage, I showed you a list of 100 random words. I didn't tell you that there was going to be a little quiz on those words. But what I want to do is a little experiment. So I read those words off very quickly, the first 10 words on that list. I didn't expect you to remember them. But I want to see if any of those words made an impression on you. So here's what we're going to do. I am going to read a word. And if you think that you heard it at the beginning of my talk, I want you to raise your right hand. If you think you did not hear it, I want you to raise your left hand. Okay? Raising no hands is not an option. Okay? Right, we're going to do this very quickly. The first word is apple. Okay? Height. Interesting. Silence. Okay? Fruit. Very interesting. Flatulence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Team. Okay? Banana. Peach. And decapitate. Okay, so that was super interesting, and I'll tell you why. Um, you all got some of them right and some of them wrong, uh, and I'm going to show you which ones. Oh, oh, sorry, one more thought. Okay. All right, so the bolded words are the ones that were actually on the list, the grayed out ones weren't. And these illustrate some principles of memory. First of all, Apple. Everybody remembered that Apple was on the list. And there's a phenomenon that has been identified by cognitive scientists called the serial positioning effect. Apple was the first word on the list. I wasn't at all surprised that you remembered it. When we're bombarded with information, we are most likely to remember the first thing that we heard and the last thing that we heard. Um, height and silence were two words that you were a little bit more confused about. And I'm also not surprised about that. Because height and silence are they're abstract words. They're not easy to visualize. They're not concrete. And we are much better at remembering information that is concrete than information that's abstract. Fruit was very interesting. A lot of people raised their right hand for fruit. But fruit was a false memory that I implanted in your brains. Fruit wasn't on the list. What was on the list was apple, pear, mango, uh, banana. But when our brains hear a bunch of specific examples of a kind, of a, of a general kind, our, our natural tendency is to zoom out and to, to think in generalities. And this is the natural sort of entropic principle of memory that all advertisers and marketers who are trying to position a product in you know, a competitive marketplace are fighting against. So fruit was not on the list. Flatulence, of course, was. And everybody remembered flatulence. There's something called the humor effect. Uh, in certain contexts, just making a piece of information funny can make it up to 50% more memorable. Likewise, decapitate. Everybody remembered decapitate. Why? And this is a principle that was written about by the earliest uh, Roman writers on memory in classical Latin. If you make a word, an image, a memory gory, if you make it weird, if you make it strange, you're much more likely to make it memorable. So there are dozens of these kinds of biases and memory effects that have been identified by cognitive scientists. And what these memory champions are doing is, effect is effectively hacking these biases. They're using our brain's natural inclinations to remember certain kinds of information better to their benefit. So this is a friend of mine. This is Ben Pridmore. He is an accountant in northern England. He uh, was the world memory champion for a number of years. On his desk in front of him are 36 shuffled packs of playing cards. He's about to try to memorize the order of every single one of those playing cards in under an hour. And he's going to do that. This was uh, when this picture was taken. He had been the only person to invent a technique that he was going to use in this contest to do this. That technique has subsequently been learned and mastered. It's like the four minute mile. Now everybody knows it in the sport of competitive memory. Because this sport, sport is driven by a kind of arms race where every year somebody's coming up with a more elaborate way to remember more stuff more quickly, and then the rest of the field plays catch up. Ben used a similar technique to remember the precise order of 4,140 random binary digits, like 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, in half an hour. Ben wasn't born with a great memory. Ben learned how to do this. And all of the techniques that are used by these memory champions, and all of the techniques that can be used by all of us to remember better in everyday life, come down to a fundamental principle that is known to psychologists as elaborative encoding. And it's well demonstrated by a famous paradox from psychology called the Baker-Baker paradox. And the Baker-Baker paradox goes like this. If I tell two people 
to remember the same word. If I say to you, Phyllis, remember that there is a person named Baker, okay? And I say to you, Howie, remember that there is a guy who is a baker, like that's his job. And I come back to the two of you in a couple weeks' time, and I say, do you remember that word that I had told you about back at the Aspen Ideas Festival? Do you remember what it was? The person who is told that this guy's name is Baker is less likely to remember the very same word as the person who is told that this guy's job is that he's a baker, right? Now, why is that? A guy named Baker, a guy who is a baker. Same word, different context, different amount of remembering. What's going on here? Well, when we hear that name Baker, capital B Baker, that is a piece of information that is totally untethered from all of the other information floating around in our skulls. It doesn't actually mean anything to us. But when we hear the common name, the common noun Baker, lowercase b Baker, that immediately gets embedded in a whole network of meaning. Right? We know what a baker is, we know what a baker looks like, we know that bakers get up early to go to work, they come home, they smell great. We know what a baker is. And that network of meaning provides a whole collection of associational hooks that make that information easier to pull back out at a later date. The entire art, the entire art of what is going on in these memory contests and the entire art of remembering better in everyday life is figuring out how to transform capital B bakers into lowercase b bakers. How do we take information that is otherwise meaningless, otherwise untethered, and make it meaningful in the light of all the other things that we already know about? So, I want to give you a very concrete example of how this works. One of the events in uh, a memory contest is called Names and Faces. It happens to be one of the events that we all also uh, compete in in everyday life. And before I teach you the tricks of how to do this, I want to introduce you to a few of my friends, okay? So that is Mike, that's Abby, that's David, that's Donald, that's Anne, that's Bill, and that's Beth. Now, if all of these people were here with us in Aspen and they weren't wearing their name tags, how many of their names do you think you'd remember? Maybe three? maybe four, if they all introduce themselves around the table. All right, I'm going to show you now how a memory champion commits those names to memory and how uh, we can all use these tricks in everyday life. So there are basically two principles to remembering people's names. The first is you've got to be paying attention when they introduce themselves. <laughs> I mean, seriously. So Samuel Johnson said the art of memory is the art of paying attention. Most of the time, when we don't remember somebody's name, it's because we're so busy thinking about like, the first clever thing we're going to say back to them, the conversational gambit that will endear us to them. We're just not listening. So the first rule of remembering somebody's name is when you walk up to them, just be thinking, like, what's your name, 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 what's your name? You have to be listening. The second rule of remembering people's names is to come up with some way to associate, to make a connection, between their name, the sound of their name, and something about their physical presence. Something that can lead you back to their name from the way that they are uh, presenting themselves to you. So let me give you some examples here. When I meet Mike, I look at him and I say, what is unique, special, different about this guy? He's got this enviable beard. So I take a second and I just make a little mental snapshot where I transform his beard into a beard of Mike's. I just take a second to do this. In my mind's eye. Abby, I look at Abby, I say, what's special about Abby? She's got these beautiful big eyes. I'm going to picture a bee stinging them. And I just take a moment to do this, and I imagine it with as much color and emotion as I possibly can. I imagine how terrible that would feel to be stung in the eyeball. And I just take a second to do this. And what I'm doing is, first of all, by creating this image, I'm forcing myself to listen, to pay attention. But I'm also creating something that, like, when next time I see her, I'm going to, what is your name? Right, I remember that B. I'm going to give myself an advantage when it comes back to trying to remember her name. Here's another trick that goes back to antiquity. You can take somebody uh, who you've met and associate them with somebody else who's famous, who shares that name. <laughs> <coughs> Donald. I look at Donald and I say, what's wrong with Donald? Donald doesn't have any eyebrows. So I'm going to give him a pair. And 
I have to say, it, it helps to be a bit of a judgmental schmuck when you're meeting people, <laughs> if you want to really remember their names. Uh, I look at Anne, I say, Anne's got this great head of hair. I'm going to picture it teeming with ants. Here's Bill. Bill's nose is like a little bit crooked. We're going to give him a bill. And Beth, this is another piece of advice that goes back to antiquity, literally to the earliest Roman memory treatises. If you want to make something memorable, make it sexy. I'm going to picture Beth in the bath, OK? So you can do this with all kinds of names. When you meet a gym, you picture him in the gym. Alice has headlights, Ben, Big Ben, Doug has got a shovel, Barbara barbed wire, Alex is driving a Lexus, so on and so forth. After my book came out, I got a call from the office of a US senator saying, Senator so and so, I won't tell you who it is, uh, would like to meet with you in his office. This is somebody who uh, his politics are sufficiently divergent from my own that I wasn't that excited about like, helping him become a more effective politician. <laughs> but I went down to Washington. He was a super nice guy. And we were in his office. And he goes to his desk. And he pulls out a legal pad on which he has handwritten all of these names and the images that he uses to associate with those names when he meets those people you know, at a political fundraiser or whatever it is. He says to me, look, this is the single most important skill I have is remembering people's names. And I work at it really hard. And here's my question for you. What am I supposed to do with quote unquote ethnic names? That was what he asked me to come down to Washington and talk to him about. So I hopefully gave him some hints. Uh, he's still in office, so I will take all the credit for that. OK, that was a little detour to hopefully get you to do a little bit of forgetting, because now I want to go back to those people and see how many of their names you remember now. OK, so who is this? Give yourselves a round of applause. You're, you're all ready to compete in the US Memory Championship. OK. So one of the oldest techniques for transforming capital B bakers into lowercase b bakers uh, was invented 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece. And it's known as the Memory Palace. And the story behind the Memory Palace, probably an apocryphal story, is that there was a Greek poet named Simonides. And Simonides was attending a banquet where he was the hired entertainment. Because back then, if you were going to throw a great party, you hired a poet to come and recite a poem. And he recites the poem. And the moment he walks out the door of the banquet hall, the roof collapses, kills everybody inside. It doesn't just kill them, it mangles their bodies beyond all recognition. Nobody can say who had been sitting where. The bodies can't be recovered in order to be properly buried. It's one giant catastrophe compounding another. And Simonides, according to legend, is standing alone amid the rubble, the sole survivor of this accident. And he closes his eyes. And in his mind's eye, he looks around the room. And he can see where each of the guests at the banquet had been sitting. And what he figured out at that moment is something that I think we all kind of intuitively know, which is that as bad as we are at remembering people's names, as bad as we are at remembering phone numbers, as bad as we are at remembering word for word instructions from our spouses, uh, <laughs> we have amazing visual and spatial memories. So if you think about this for a second, if you were to come uh, visit my home in Boston, if you were going to spend three minutes just like walking through my house and observing, and then walked out the door, you would, upon walking out the door, be able to tell somebody, like, that's where the kitchen was. That's where the living room was. I can picture where the sofa was. You might be able to picture where there was art on the wall. We don't register that as a feat of memory. But if you think about it, it kind of is, right? That's actually a large amount of data that you're walking out of my house with. And what Simonides figured out was, oh, what if we use the fact that we have this incredible visual spatial memory to, instead of remembering where the sofa and the refrigerator in Josh's house is, what if we stored images of the information that we wanted to remember? And that's the idea behind the memory palace. I'm going to give you a very concrete, particular example of this so that you all can see how this works. So what we're going to do together is we're going to memorize a list of information. We're going to memorize a shopping list. And to do this, I want everybody to close your eyes and picture yourself standing outside the front door of your home. Okay. So outside the front door of your home, the first word on our shopping list is milk. I want you to picture yourself pouring a gallon of milk 
over your head outside the front door of your house. I want you to picture the dairy dripping down your body, what it would smell like, what it would feel like. And then I want you to open the door of your house. The second word we're going to remember is eggs. Okay? I want you to picture somebody I want you to picture a chicken juggling eggs, okay? A chicken juggling eggs inside the front door of your house because if you saw a chicken juggling eggs in your real life, you would never ever forget that. <laughs> and then I want you to Go to the right. Whatever the next room is to the right of your house, I'm now entering the kitchen. I want you to picture spaghetti. Do you remember Chef Boyardee, the guy with the big hat from the TV commercials? I want you to picture Chef Boyardee breaking some spaghetti in two, okay? You can hear the crunching sound of the spaghetti breaking in two, and he drops it into a boiling pot of water, and the water boils over, okay? Now we're going into the next room of your house. I'm entering uh, the dining room. The word is, word is cottage cheese. I want you to picture the most attractive, sexiest person you can imagine. Hopefully it's your spouse. <laughs> Bathing naked in a tub of cottage cheese, okay? Like really take a minute to imagine that in full 3D virtual reality, augmented reality color, okay? The next word is bananas. Go into the next room of your house and I want you to picture the person that you most despise in the world slipping on a banana in this room of your house, okay? The next word is olive oil. I am now in uh, the living room. I want you to picture uh, olive oil from the Popeye cartoons, taking a bottle of olive oil and uh, sprinkling it on the floor, okay? And then Popeye comes and, and just does a big slip and slide across the floor. So that's olive oil. And then the last word we're gonna remember, I'm now walking up the stairs, is red wine. So I want you to picture somebody stumbling around drunk with a bottle of wine remember that it's red wine and not white wine, make it a communist, a famous communist, make it Fidel Castro stumbling around drunk with a bottle of wine. Okay, open your eyes. We're now going to return to the front door of your house. What was the first word on the list? Oh. You walk inside and you see? Eggs. And then the next room? Chicken. And then after that? Oh, and then? Banana. And after bananas? Oh. And then? Oh. Okay. So that was great, that was seven words. Can you see how you could just keep going and get to 100 words? No. <laughs> That's what I said the first time somebody suggested this to me. But I promise you, and I, and I would encourage you to go try this, it is actually a relatively trivial matter to keep going, to go from seven to 100 and beyond, because our visual and spatial memories are that good. And this actually probably works a whole lot better out here in Aspen than it does if you live in a New York City studio apartment. <laughs> um, but that is the basic trick. Now, these techniques were not invented for remembering shopping lists, and they weren't invented for remembering the order of shuffled packs of playing cards. They were invented in antiquity specifically for remembering speeches. These were tools of oratory and rhetoric. So Cicero, the great orator of the Roman Republic, said, you know, if you want to remember a speech, don't try and do it word for word. You're just going to find yourself trying to remember what the next word is. You're going to forget. You're going to sound like a robot. I'm not sure you use the word robot. But don't try and do it like that. If you want to remember a speech, what you do is you create an image of every topic that you're going to address in your speech. And you put those images inside of a memory palace. And as you're delivering your speech, you walk through your memory palace, and that's basically a blueprint for your talk. And in fact, the phrase topic sentence, the word, to the phrase topic sentence, comes from the Greek word topos, topic topos. Topos means place. That's a vestige of when people used to think about oratory and rhetoric in these kinds of spatial terms. You know the phrase in the first place? In the first place. You ever wonder where that came from? That's in the first place of your memory palace. That's where that comes from. All right. I want to talk now about like, some news you can use. How can you use these memory techniques to remember numbers? This is a really handy, uh, handy thing that I use just about every day in my life. Uh, and I'm going to show you the simplest system that memory champions use to remember numbers. It's called the major system. It's a little code. And the way it works is every digit from 0 to 9 is associated with a different uh, sound. So like zero is an S sound, one is a T or a D sound, two is an N, three is an M, four is an R, R et cetera, five L. And the way it works is when you encounter a number, like say, 
let's see here, 52. You can take these consonants, 5 and 2, and fill in any kind of vowel you want in between. So 52 would be an L and an N, a lion. So if I was staying in room 52 here in Aspen, I would picture a lion outside of my hotel room door. Um, if I was staying in room 92, I would say a P or a B and an N. It could be a pin. It could be somebody named Ben. It could be a pen. I might picture a pen writing on the door. And that would just be like my little trick to remember where I was staying. Um, 14, a T or a D and an R. If I parked my car in spot 14, I might picture a giant monster truck tire rolling over my car. And if I had uh, to remember the number 529,214, I would just picture a lion drawing with a pen on a tire, which is an image that you have positively absolutely never seen before, which means it's an image that's not competing with any other image in your mind, right? That's totally new, it's novel, and therefore more memorable. Um, I use this for remembering credit card numbers, remembering phone numbers you don't really need anymore. Uh, I am staying here in room 204, the, the Nasser suite uh, of the Aspen Meadows. And this takes about 10 minutes to learn, OK? But then once you've learned this, you can use it for the rest of your life. And you can find this on the internet. You can find it in my book, Moonwalking with Einstein. I actually also had somebody print up some cards with these, uh, the major system on. If you want to take these, I'll leave them up here. You can put it in your wallet. Um, this is what a memory championship actually looks like, OK? It's like got all of the excitement of a bunch of people taking the SATs. And remember, I'm there as a journalist. And my job is to find drama, to find tension. And like, this is about as dramatic as it gets. There's like somebody rubbing their temples. But I need to get some drama out of this, some excitement. And I figure I got to like, figure out a way to walk in these people's shoes. I got to get inside their brains. And so I start really trying to train my memory. So every morning when I wake up, before I sit down with my cup of coffee in the New York Times, I would try and remember something, to memorize something. I would take a poem and try and memorize a poem or some phone numbers and try and memorize those phone numbers. I bought some old high school yearbooks and tried to memorize the names from those yearbooks. Uh, if you want to try this yourself, I have this piece of advice. Don't buy yearbooks from the 1950s because everybody looked exactly the same. And I got really into this. I actually got kind of obsessed with it. And I got kind of obsessed with it because it was surprisingly fun. And here's why it was fun. Because I wasn't actually training my memory. What I was training was my ability to come up with really funny, weird, strange images in my mind's eye very quickly, which was something I would never normally under regular circumstances exercise. And if you do that, if you can come up with a funny, strange, interesting image, like your memory takes care of itself. So like I said, I got kind of obsessed with this. And this is a picture of me that ran on the cover of the New York Times Magazine wearing the traditional memorizer's uh, comp competing competitive kit. OK, so I've got on a pair of earmuffs to block out any sound. And I'm wearing some goggles that have been totally masked out except for two little pinholes because distraction is the competitive memorizer's uh, enemy. And I decided I was going to go back to that same contest that I had covered a year before. And this time I thought, you know, I spent a year learning about memory. This will be a nice little epilogue to whatever I'm, you know, ultimately going to write about this, the story I'm going to tell. The problem was I ended up winning the contest, <laughs> which really wasn't supposed to happen. And not only did I win the contest, I set a new US record at the time by memorizing the order of a shuffled pack of playing cards in a minute and 40 seconds, which, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Uh, but before you applaud, I should actually tell you, the current record is 13 seconds, <laughs> which is almost as fast as you can turn the cards over. So I ended up writing this book, Moonwalking with Einstein, about this experience and about the techniques that I learned along the way. And it is totally nice to be able to remember numbers. It's totally useful to be able to remember people's names. One day I will take my skill with cards to Las Vegas and make some money off this, but I wrote this book a number of years ago and it still hasn't happened yet. But here's what I want to leave you with. These are all just tricks. These are tricks that fundamentally work because they make you work, right? They work because they force you to pay attention. They work because they give you an excuse to take information and figure out how to make it meaningful to yourself.
That's the basic work of memory. These incredible memory capacities are absolutely latent and dormant inside of all of us. We just have to bother to awaken them. We just have to remember to remember. So I want to leave it there and open this up to any questions. And I think there's somebody circulating with a, with a microphone. Um, thank you very much. That was really interesting. I have one um, question about the memory palace, because I, in fact, have used that before. But if you make up a grocery shopping list on Monday, and you got it all worked through in your memory palace and you're successful on that Monday, then five days later you go shopping again. So you have to make a new memory palace. And then you get to the grocery store and you get to your living room and sort of <laughs> the cottage cheese from Monday sort of is there instead of what you would put in it that morning. So if you have a memory palace, how do you make sure that it's refreshed for every time you used it? Well, it hopes, helps to own multiple homes. <laughs> By the way, that joke doesn't land everywhere. <laughs> uh, no, but in all seriousness, in all seriousness, the, you know, you, you, you make one memory palace in your house, you make one memory palace in your kid's house, you make one memory palace in your, your place of work, you make one memory palace in, we actually experience a lot of architecture in our daily lives, and what memory champions do is they're like collectors of architecture in a really kind of interesting Borgesian way. They're like walking around looking at buildings as structures to hold future memories, which is fascinating. And actually, most of the work uh, of training for that memory contest was in doing exactly that, was in walking around and saying, like, okay, my college dorm, right, what was that like? That's gonna become a memory palace, like my uncle's house, that's gonna become a memory palace. So that's part of the answer. The other part of the answer is, your memories naturally fade along a gradient. It's known as the, the curve of forgetting. And if you wanna make a memory lasting for the long term, if you wanna make a really enduring memory, these techniques are great for cramming the information in, but if you wanna make it stick, you gotta come back to it. You come back to it a week later, you come back to it two months later, three years later. That's how you make a memory stick. If you don't do that, your memories will fade. So if you're shopping every week and trying to use the same memory palace, it won't work. But if you use a memory palace and then let it kind of deteriorate uh, over a couple of weeks, you'll find that you won't have competing memories in there. So that's the other piece of this. Thank you for sharing your process. Um, now that you can remember almost everything, how has that impacted your social life and your work? <laughs> and also, um, are there things that you'd rather forget, and do you have a process for intentionally forgetting things? Okay, so let me be perfectly clear, and my wife is here to confirm this. I absolutely do not remember everything. Uh, in some cases, I don't remember anything, she'll tell you. Um, why is the toilet seat still up? et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but if you're asking about like, how this has impacted my social life, the answer is negatively, and here's why. Because once you're the memory champ, people really expect you to remember their names. And if you don't, you're just a giant schmuck, right? Because all I'm saying to you is I actually didn't care quite enough to make that image to remember your name which may or may not actually be the case. Like I'm not, this only works if you're on, right? These techniques only work if you are uh, remembering to use them. And it takes work, like this takes work. But that's why the techniques work. And for the, like, the same way that anybody forgetting somebody's name is in some way like, uh, not a critique, but it's a, it's a, it doesn't feel good. For me, it's like even worse. And so I live with that and, it kind, of, and kind of suffer from that, actually. Yeah. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, if you have a learning disability, uh, dyslexia, uh, ADHD, can these type of techniques apply when you can't keep your focus to make a palace or hold something in your working memory? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm actually not aware of any research on using these techniques with ADHD 
particularly. So I can't I can't give you a good answer to that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, for those who have not seen your great work with Atlas Obscura, for those who want to go to see interesting and weird and wacky things around the world, so thank you for that gift uh, thank you. as well. Um, when I was uh, 16 and didn't have many friends, I uh, memorized Pi to 500 places, and I used it as a song. And I'm thinking, as you think about spatial memory, we can all remember music from 30 and 40 years ago. And so are there any techniques also to convert this to kind of music type rhythm to help commit to memory? Right, great question, and thank you for mentioning Atlas Obscura. Uh, so we all have this, uh, are familiar with this phenomenon that we can be in the shower singing a song that we haven't heard for you know, 20 years and remember the lyrics word for word. Um, and that is a function of the ways in which, I think, music is a structuring device in the same way that a memory palace is, in a way, right? So music is adding to a set of words, uh, rhythm, meter, rhyme, and all of those are techniques for essentially cueing you to like what comes next. And so it's not a coincidence that musical lyrics are more memorable even than unsung poems. We know that the Odyssey and the Iliad and uh, the great epic poems of all pre-oral cultures tended to be sung, tended to be performed. And that was because um, the meter, the rhyme, that provides an extra layer of meaning and structure that makes it easier to recall the information. Yeah, back there. Thank you. Um, I can see how remembering items like milk or eggs or cottage cheese, it helps or even credit card numbers, but I'm thinking something a lot more precious to me is experiences. Do you have any techniques that, because once an experience is lost or fades away, it's a lot more precious loss than getting cottage cheese twice in a row. Somewhere. That's a beautiful question. Um, <clears throat> I had the incredible opportunity to interview and write one of the first pieces uh, about a woman named AJ. That was her initials in the medical literature at the time, who was the first person diagnosed with what was then called hyperthymestic syndrome. Uh, it's subsequently been rebranded as superior autobiographical memory, highly superior autobiographical memory. These are people, and now there have been a few dozen of them identified around the world, who can basically remember every day of their lives. And I sat with this woman in uh, a hotel in Beverly Hills, where she lived, and quizzed her. You know, August 11th, 1989, what happened on Murphy Brown that night? And by God, she knew. And I mean, I could not stump her. I could not stump her on the most esoteric trivia about her life. And it was remarkable, because this was a woman who was not doing this using the memory palace. This was not using any technique I was familiar with. And yet, once I started digging in and talking to her more about her life, I started to realize there's something kind of weird going on. And it turns out that um, one of the things that seems to run in parallel with or correlates with this highly superior autobiographical memory is some measure of obsessive compulsive disorder. And so I started talking to her, and she was telling me about how she kept these very detailed journals of the weather. She would write in little tiny scripts about what happened to her every day. Every morning when she was um, blow drying her hair, she would flip back through the calendar, almost like a Rolodex, of what was I doing on this day last year? What was I doing on this day two years ago? What was I doing on this day three years ago? And so what she was doing was constantly refreshing her memories of her life. And what I found really interesting and kind of moving about this was, like, it made me wonder, is she the one who's crazy or am I the one who's crazy? Because like, of all the things that one could be invested in remembering, one's own life seems to be like, why, why don't we all do this, right? And I don't think there's anything particularly magical about that uh, disorder, quote unquote disorder. I think it's actually something that's probably accessible, that skill, to all of us, if we were so moved to try and do that. The question I think that is really interesting and worth pondering is, why don't we do that? Why don't we all do that? So, 
Yeah, over here. Thank you for your brilliant presentation. I have two questions. One, is widow brain real, and what can we do to have better memories? And two, what kind of advice would you give to Chuck Close, who never recognizes a face, not even if he crosses the street and sees his ex-wife? Uh, I would tell him to, instead of trying to paint those faces using broad strokes, they use little pointillist patterns. Um, no, I, I actually, that, that is a real thing. Uh, facial prosopagnosia, I think is the, I may be mispronouncing that, but face blindness is a very real thing. Oliver Sacks supposedly had it as well. I don't have any advice for that. Um, I think you asked about, you said widow brain. Uh, and one of the things that is true about our memories is, uh, and this reveals, I think, a false metaphor that we often use when we talk about our memories. We talk about our memories as though they were like banks, right? We deposit information in, we withdraw information out. And it makes it seem like, and I think, by the way, this is connected to um, like our sense that our brains are kind of parallel to computers, and so we use the metaphors of computers with our, with our memories. Uh, in previous centuries, people talked about their memories and using metaphors of you know, wax disks or uh, wax tablets or um, you know, uh, holograms. So whatever the technology is, that's how we think about our memories. We think about our memories like we put stuff in, we take stuff out. But what that forgets and what that misrepresents is that our memories actually don't just live in our own brains. Our memories extend beyond ourselves into uh, other technologies. So there's like a really very real way in which my memory is partially up here and kind of like partially in my iPhone. There's also a very real way in which my memory is partially in my own mind and partially in my wife's mind. And there are things that I don't remember because I know that like, she's got that. And so I can kind of like let that go. And so one of the phenomenon is when somebody loses a spouse is that they discover how much of their memory was external to themselves and, and, and lived inside of somebody else. This is also true of um, people with Alzheimer's. When you take somebody with Alzheimer's outside of their comfort zone, outside of the house that they live in, and put them in a different living environment, often they deteriorate very quickly. And that's in part because they were using that house as a kind of external memory aid. And their memories were in here, but also out there. And you've removed that from them. So I hope that's like a partial answer to your question. Over here. Um, what what was the connection between uh, the, num the theory behind the connection of the numbers to the letters that you described? Before? Yeah, I should, have, I should have been clearer about that. Totally arbitrary. That was a system that was developed in the 17th century that people just said, oh, that works. OK, we'll keep using it. And so the, the one is an S, the two isn't. Somebody figured it out 300 plus years ago, and it's just stuck. So there's no, there's no rhyme or reason to it. You just have to memorize it. But I promise you, it doesn't take that long. And you, seriously, come and take one of these or, uh, or grab a copy of the book. Yeah, any more questions? Over here. Where? Oh. Are you aware of any good stories of people who used better memory to lift performance uh, in their jobs? I could imagine it really helping a Major League Baseball pitcher or people on Wall Street, uh, not just for the competitions, but, but in the jobs they already have. Um, Am I aware of specific examples? I mean, <laughs> also grocery checkout, uh, right? If you need to remember those, the codes of the, the vegetables. The truth is, like, there is some applicability of these skills to like every possible domain because everybody has to remember something, um, whether it's in you know finance or or grocery checkouts. But uh, specific examples. G give me pause on that and think about it for a second, and I'll come back to you. Yes, there's something, somebody over here. Yes. Thanks, Josh. Um, just a kind of a plug for your book. Well, I actually heard it in the audio version. And um, I was driving along, and I had my sweet mother-in-law next to me. And the way you designed your book is to start right away with those sexy, pornographic um, <laughs> string of memories. And so I'm listening to the audiobook, I'm popping on, thinking, oh, this is going to be great. Yeah, my mother-in-law. And it's like, <laughs> shit, fuck. God. I, Eddie, I just brilliant. And I loved your book. And I try to use it with my students. 
great stuff. Uh, and I don't know, do you have another book? Thank you. First of all, uh, some of that actually flew over a lot of readers' heads, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad it, <laughs> you, you caught that. Um, yeah, so I'm working on another book right now about the world's last hunter-gatherers. So I spent uh, about four and a half years going back and forth to the Republic of Congo, where the largest remaining group of hunter-gatherers, the Imbengeli pygmies, uh, still live and hunt and gather and don't practice agriculture for the most part. And I'm trying to tell the story about particularly one guy and his family and what it is like to be a hunter-gatherer in the 21st century and how they think about the world and how they think about themselves and what, if anything, we might be able to learn from this very ancient way of life. So keep an eye out for that. Over here. And I think this may be, might be the last question. It's a lot of pressure, last question. Um, yeah, you know, uh, if I'm in a meeting or a class or let's say your session, I'm, I'm jotting down some notes and, and my thought is that that helps me memorize and often I don't ever look back at the notes, right? But what I'm wondering is, and I, and I can't do real-time visualization of things like you're suggesting while I'm in taking all this information, is there a better way or an alternative way of, of dealing with that? Yeah, so this is actually something that has been studied uh, a little bit. And it is definitely demonstrably true that if you are like taking notes with multiple colors, that that improves your memory, for your recall of that information later on. If you're drawing pictures while you're taking notes, I mean, of the, not doodles, but like of, you know, things to help you remember what you're learning. The more you are engaging your mind in the act of taking notes and not just um, sort of rote copying, the more those notes are going to help you later on, not even when you're going back to look at them, but later on when you're recalling that information. It's just making that many more associations. So yeah, if you can get one of those pens that you, you know you can click multiple colors, then um, yeah. So I think that is actually probably, uh, oh, one, sorry, one more question. One more, yes. Oh, wait, did you have one in mind? <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess it did help yeah. the senator, right? He's, he's, still, he's still in office. Um, yeah. No, why don't we call it there? Uh, and thank you very much. <laughs>